Come on, come on, yeah. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand clap this morning. Yes. Beautiful. Amazing. Man, I love being in a church where you can feel God's presence. Where, you know, you know, we live in a generation, we live in a time, we live in a culture where the church, we need to learn how to touch heaven. Because there's a world that desperately needs God. And man, so can we just give the band another hand, man? They just led so amazingly. So awesome. And I don't know, are you guys going to stay up here? You can go back to your seats. I don't, it's, it's, up to, it's up to you guys. Hey, I was, I was praying actually in the spirit. I was just like, Jesus, just let, let Joe, she can just keep going for another 20, 25 minutes. I won't have to preach. She's like, no chance. You did. Sarah's like, I didn't get it, so you're not getting it. Man, such, I'm, I'm feeling the presence of God. Wow. And, uh, you know, Pastor Joe said, said it powerfully, you know, who's enjoying this, this series on Ruth? Is anybody enjoying it as much as I am? It is so, so awesome. And, um. Before we get into the depths of it, I just want to take a step back and make sure that all of us are on the same page with what we're trying to accomplish in this series of Ruth. Because, you know, sometimes it's easy to walk into church and you kind of go, well, we're, we're doing this series. I kind of forget where we're going. So I just want to remind us, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we launched it, Pastor Jeff started off and he said, you know, Jesus in John 10.10 10, has invited us into a story that reclaims us, each one of us, not just the pastors, not just the leadership, each and every one, is a, one of us, Jesus is inviting us into the story. And it's a story that covers, hopefully, the span of your life. And it's a story that just doesn't happen when you're 7, 8, or 9, or 10 years old, and you, the preacher says, hey, do you need to ask Jesus into your life? And you say, yes. I need Jesus in my world, and that is good. There's nothing wrong with that. But hopefully that's the beginning of a series of moments where we keep inviting Jesus into our world. In our teenage years, in our adolescent years, when we're growing up, we're starting to learn about what it means to operate in finance, when we're making decisions about who I'm going to marry and where I'm going to go to church and who am I going to let in my world. This is a constant, and Jesus is inviting us into a world where he wants to give us full life. That's the backbone of our church. That's the, it's in our mission statement, inviting everyone in our influence to experience what? Full life. And that's the kind of life that God wants to give you. And the more that we understand the Bible, because that's primarily how we get to know God, the more we understand the Bible, the more we understand what it is he wants to give us, what he has for us, the blessing of heaven. He wants to for each person sitting in here to have this amazing life that comes from him. And so really, when, when we launched in week one, Pastor Jeff talked about, you know, the, the, the fullness of the Bible is only stood, is only understood in its entire story. In other words, the Bible is one story that leads to Jesus. And all the characters and all the situations and all the books, particularly we're talking about the book of Ruth, all those things are best thought of in that light. Because if you take particularly chapter 1 of week 1 when we went into Ruth, it, quite frankly, it's depressing. You have this woman, named uh, her name is Naomi. There's a famine in, 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 the city, in the nation of Israel. They've turned away from God, and so they're leaving, and they go to this, the land of Moab. And you go, well, what does that mean for me, and, and how do I you know, relate to that? Because if you just look at that story, you can, go, you can sweep it under the rug and go, that doesn't apply to me. But if we take a look at it in the context of, of what God is trying to accomplish. Pastor Jeff said it like this. It's just one of the tiles in this great mosaic that God is creating. And when we look at it from that light, we, we, we can see 
this rich undertone of, of foreshadowing that is happening. And so the takeaway from week one, week one is really, you know, the Bible requires a lot of reflection. And just like how God moves in our life, where it may not be apparent so much from the start, but as you reflect on it, as you retell the stories, as you look back, you can kind of see the hidden layers and the movements of God's hand in it all. So that was really, that was week one. Week two, 10 years has passed by, and then we get, we, we show up in chapter two of the book of Ruth, and now they are leaving the land of Moab, and she's returning to the nation of Israel because she heard that the blessing of God, Naomi heard that the blessing of God had come back to the nation, but when she shows up in Bethlehem, she says, I'm bitter, I'm angry, God has only brought pain in my life, don't call me Naomi. She's just, she's so angry about her pain and situation that she misses what God is actually enfolding, unfolding in front of her. And how many of us are like that, where we are facing, she was in a famine. Her pain was real. It wasn't just pretend or theoretical. And how many of us are just like that, where we are stuck in situations, we might be facing a circumstance, there might be some real pain happening in our world, and all of a sudden, we just get blinded, and we can't see. You ever hear that? Man, you're so close to it, you can't really see the, the bigger picture because you're so close to it. And so if we have to take a step back, the takeaway from week two is what can we learn about God's presence from that week and that chapter? She came back, and you remember Pastor Jeff kind of ra wrapped up his message last week with the three R's. He was like, there's relationship. There's, um, there's recognition, and then there's repentance. You remember when he said repentance? Because all of a sudden, blessing started coming. They returned, and it was the, the beginning of the barley harvest. And she repented. She said, God is being good to me. He's being good to you, Naomi. And, and I just, I missed it. And so what I want to talk about today in week three is really what was it that caused her to have that moment of repentance? What was it that Naomi saw that caused her to fall down on her knees and say, God was really there all along and I just, just missed it? What was it? And the concept is a word in Hebrew and it's known as chesed or chesed. I'm going to try to lay off the ch chesed and this concept it's a word in hebrew and it really combines all of these characteristics of the nature and character of god his love his grace his kindness his mercy his long suffering his loyalty to his people and in hebrew they they came up with this word to try to ex explain all of those characteristics and uh and so really what we discover and what we're going to talk about today is this concept of hesed and where do we see it and it shows up primarily through a character named Boaz and the whole story of Ruth the whole book of Ruth takes a turn on this concept of hesed and and so if we just have a couple of chapters but here we have someone that's experiencing so much pain but it was because of God's hesed and him working through a person that we see reclamation happening. Ruth, a story that reclaims us. Naomi gets reclaimed. Uh, uh, Ruth gets reclaimed. It's a story of reclamation, and, and it all comes about because of this concept of hesed. So the, the, the takeaway, what we want you to understand today, if you don't walk away with anything else that I say, I want you to hear this. You can trust in God's love. He is faithful. He remains loyal to us. And he is long-suffering forever with us, even when we go astray. And he still loves us that way today. And in the story of Naomi, when she kind of turned away from that, 
and then sort of started turning back to that, God was still faithful, and he, he still loves us that way. And you know what? He wants us to love others that way as well. So the title of my message today is Love in Action. And so uh, I'm going to bring up a scripture that comes out of Exodus chapter 34, verses 5 and 6. They're going to bring it up on the screen here. And this is God is speaking to Moses. And this is after the Israelites have kind of formed that, you know, God said, don't create idols and don't have any other gods before me. And they go, awesome. And then Moses goes away, and what's the first thing they do? They throw their gold in this thing, and they, they form an idol and a calf. God wants to destroy them, but Moses says, no, don't, don't, don't. You're long-suffering. Moses reminds God of his own character, and God says, oh, you know what? You're right. I'm long-suffering. I'm going to stay with these people. And so this is how God describes himself in his love. It says, then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him, Moses, that's Moses, and he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. Now, we throw that word around in church like crazy. Yeah, God is love. God, I know love. God loves me. But what does that really mean? If we really t take a step back and go, what does it mean that God is like that right there? Because how many of us know that, man, I turn from God in so many ways, so many times during the course of my life? Can, can anybody else give me an amen on that? Am I the only one? We turn away from God, but he is faithful. And so why don't we just take a look at this Bible Project video that will hopefully explain this concept of hesed. If you tried to describe what God is like, it could be difficult or daunting. But when the people who wrote the Bible pondered the mystery of God, they consistently described God's character in this way. Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, overflowing with loyal love and faithfulness. We're going to look at this fourth phrase, loyal love. It translates the Hebrew word chesed, which is hard to translate into any language because it combines the ideas of love, generosity, and enduring commitment all into one. Chesed describes an act of promise-keeping loyalty that is motivated by deep personal care. Like in the story of Ruth, Ruth is a foreigner married to an Israelite man, but tragically, her husband dies along with his brother and his father. All Ruth has left is her widowed mother-in-law, Naomi, who has nothing to give her. Naomi tells Ruth she should go back to her people, but instead, Ruth promises to stay by Naomi's side and take care of her. And as other people watch Ruth keep this promise over time, they call it an act of chesed. Notice that Ruth's chesed is not conditional or based on Naomi's worth. Rather, it's an expression of Ruth's character. She just is a generous and loving person who keeps her word. That's chesed. Now, Ruth's loyal love is truly inspiring, but the one who shows the most enduring chesed in the Bible is God. Like in the story about Jacob, who is a treacherous liar even to his own family. But despite that, God chooses him and repeats the promise he made to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, that he would have a huge family through whom God would restore his blessing to the nations. And so 20 years later, when Jacob realizes how undeserving he is, he says to God, I'm not worthy of all the chesed you've shown me. And he's right. But God's chesed was never about Jacob's worth in the first place. It's a display of God's generous loyalty to his promise. God's chesed continues into the story of Jacob's descendants, the Israelites. When they're enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt, we're told that God remembered his promise to Abraham and Jacob, so God defeats and raises up Moses to liberate the people and lead them into the promised land. And in the story, this is called an act of chesed because it was about God keeping his word. Now, on their way to the promised land, the Israelites are scared of the nations around them and they doubt that God can protect them. So the people threaten to kill Moses and appoint a new leader to take them back to Egypt. God is understandably hurt and angry, but Moses steps in and says, Forgive the sin of these people because of your great chesed. Notice that Moses asked God to forgive, not because the people deserve it, but because it's consistent with God's own character. And God agrees, and he recommits himself to a people that don't want to be committed to him. 
In the Bible, God is loyal and loving for no other reason than it's just who God is. Of course he wants his people to respond with chesed in return, but even when they don't, God's chesed remains. The prophet Hosea compared Israel's chesed to a morning mist that's here one moment and gone the next. But God's chesed is enduring. Like in the celebration of Psalm 136 that opens by saying, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, and then 26 times repeats, his chesed is forever. And so, after centuries of Israel betraying their commitment to God, and after humanity's long history of violence and death, God still kept his promise in a dramatic and drastic way by becoming human and binding himself to us in the person of Jesus. And the people who followed Jesus of Nazareth said that in him, they encountered the God of Israel who is full of loyal love and truth. Jesus is the ultimate loyal and loving human. And in his life, death and resurrection, God opened up a new future for all of us and for all of creation. And God did this because it's just who God is, generous, loving, and eternally loyal to his promises. And when we experience the purity and power of God's loyal love shown through Jesus, it compels us to reimagine why and how we can show chesed back to God and to the people around us. This is what it means to say that God is overflowing it is. I mean, how good is God? He extends this loyal love even when we don't reciprocate. But that is his nature. And so you go, okay, great. So what does that have to do with the book of Ruth? Because what I'm getting ready to do is, you know, last week, as I said, Pastor Jeff, you know, he gave us those three R's, relationship, recognition, and repentance. Well, today I'm going I'm to give you three P's, and these three P's recommend or, or, or represent uh, acts of God's Hesed, or this is love in action coming through the person n- known as Boaz. He is a person. He didn't have to do these things. He was as real as as you. He was as real as me. But it's through these actions that all of a sudden the story almost like flips on its head, and all of a sudden the blessing of heaven starts coming because of the actions of this man. And so we're going to hop right into it, and, 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 you know, from the video we saw, you know, Ruth, she was loyal and faithful to Naomi. Naomi had nothing to offer her, but, but Ruth said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with you, and many of us know that verse in Ruth chapter 1 where she says, I'm going to go where you go. And your God is going to be my God. And where you die, I'm going to die. I mean, she was committed, and that was an act of hesed. It was her loyalty, her faithfulness to her mother-in-law. But really, we see hesed really come to the forefront in this person of Boaz. And so the first thing I want to bring up is Ruth chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I'm going to read that. And the first act of hesed that Boaz does is he gives uh, Ruth a place. He gives her a place. Starting verse 8, Boaz, so, so, so let me just kind of set the stage a little bit. Ruth is like now living in Jerusalem, and she was like, I need to get busy. I need to take some responsibility, and, and I need to get to work. I need to put my hands to work. And it's that attitude that sort of kind of initiates what's getting ready to happen. And I find that it's interesting throughout this whole storyline that her willingness, her ability to be willing to say yes, to remain faithful, to submit to discipleship, to submit to the culture of the kingdom of God, and all of a sudden, blessing comes down. And so she says, I need to go out into a field, and she, all of a sudden, she finds herself in Boaz's field, but Boaz doesn't know who she is, so he inquires and says, who is that, that woman working in the field? And they said, well, that's, that's Ruth. And he goes, oh, I know about her. So he comes over to her and he says this, starting in verse 8. Boaz went over and said to Ruth, listen, my daughter, stay right here with us where you gather grain. Do not go into any other fields. Stay right behind the young women working in my field. 
see which part of the field they are harvesting, and then follow them. I have war- warned the young men not to treat you roughly, and when you are thirsty, help yourself to the water they have drawn from the well. Bo- what is Boaz doing right here? Boaz is, he. this is love in action. He is creating a place so that Ruth can find herself productive. She can find herself putting her hand to the plow and not looking back. God has given each and every one of us a place in your marriage. He has given you a place in your workplace. He has given you a place in your job. He has given you a place in our church. He has given you a place. You know, each Sunday we we, we try to create places for people. The parking lot team, the cafe, the children's place, the youth the, the, the service team, the next steps team, the kids, we, we're creating space. We're creating places for people so that they can put their hand to the bow plow and be productive. And what Boaz says to her is incredible because he was like, make sure that you go follow the women and see where they're harvesting. There are so many talented people in this church who have gifts on their life and they're producing fruit. And you should go follow some of those people. That's why we have connect groups. So you get around these people and you start harvesting what they're harvesting. You start learning what they're doing. You start, you start realizing, oh, they're being productive and they're, they're, they're reaping a benefit. I want that too. And so, and so w- what is Boaz doing right here? He is creating a place for her to thrive. And it's almost like he's inviting her into his world so that she can be productive. That's like what we do in the connect groups. We want everyone to be productive. It's like disciple making, inviting people into your world. So what about like, so let's, let's, let's break it down to the practical. You know, you know, God has given you, like it, it says right here in, in that verse, it says, do not go to any other fields. God has given you a field. He's given you your home. He's given you this church. He's given you your job. How are you treating that field? There's so many people that go, okay, I arrived, and then they want to hop on to the next thing. I went to this church. Now I'm going to this church. Now I've gone here. Now I'm going there. And they're scattered. They're not planted, and they can't grow and really effectively use the gifts that God has given them. Are you following me? And so what we try to do here is is create room. How are you creating room? How are you creating a place? How are you inviting people into your world that gives them a place where they can thrive? Do you, are, you, are, you, are you following me? Are you, is this making sense? So the first thing he did was he created a place for her. Let's go on to the next thing that he did. And the next one is he provided or there's provision. I'm going to read Uh, Ruth chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, and then verse 23. Let's read it together. He said, at mealtime, Boaz called her and said, come over here and help yourself to some food. You can dip your bread in the sour wine. So she sat with her harvesters, and Boaz gave her some roasted grain to eat. She ate all she wanted, and she, uh, she, she still had some left over. And when Ruth went back to work, he ordered his young men, let her gather grain right among the sheaves without stopping her, and pull out some heads of barley from the bundles and drop them on purpose. He's being super generous. He's not just going, oh, that, that just that, that's enough. That's all she needs. No, he's being generous with her. And he goes, and he says, so let her pick them up and don't give her a hard time. So Ruth gathered the barley, and when she beat out the grain in the evening, she filled the entire basket, and she carried it back into town and showed her mother-in-law. And Ruth also gave her the roasted grain that was left over from the meal. Interesting how she's just not selfish about what Boaz gave her. She just had roasted grain for a little, and now she's like, she wants to give out. At why? Man, God's being generous to me. Let me be generous back. How are you being generous to people? Boaz was generous to Ruth. And so, and so you, you know, the late Bill Gray, my, my, my buddy, you know, he, he died about almost about a year ago. And uh, he used to show up at church. He told, he told me this story. He used to show up at church with $2,000 in his pocket every Sunday. And he would just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, who do you want me to bless today? How, how, how do you want me to bless? And God blessed his business so that he could do that. 
And, and you go, well, you know, I don't have a business and I can't do that. But generosity is just not about the dollar amount. All of us have the gift of generosity, just like Kim was talking about. All of us have this gift. It doesn't have to just be about amounts. I, you know, I am so proud of this church. Um, is Gwen Franklin here? Is she, is, is, I don't know, she, she, her mother passed, passed away just like a couple of days ago. And, you know, I lost my mom about 10 years ago. And so I sent her a text and I was like, hey, I understand the pain. I understand what you're going through. How are you doing and all that. I want, I want to read this, read this right here. This is her response. She was like, hello, Pastor Eric. C3 family have been remarkable. The calls, the text messages, the prayers, they have been greatly appreciated. Thank you all so much. There are no words. I love my church family. I am grateful to all of you. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand. Another, we can be generous with our kindness. We can be generous with pouring out. The Bible says bear one another's burdens. And so she's got a family, a group of people that are pouring out in their life surrounding her through this difficult time. Do you follow what I'm saying? Boaz gave her a place. Boaz gave Ruth provision. And I want to set this, 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 this last P up. This is the last P. And I want to set the story up because after a little bit of time, uh, Naomi and Ruth were kind of getting established. And so Naomi is like, man, I, I need to give, uh, you, you know, Ruth, she needs to get her own permanent place. So she starts playing matchmaker. Do we have any ladies in this house that are playing matchmaker? Where's, uh, where's you know, who, who can we hook up with who? And so this is what Naomi is doing. She is like, Ruth, I got to get Ruth a permanent place. And she is like, she's found favor with my relative, Boaz. And so this is what I'm, this is what I ask you to do. Ruth, you need to do this. And I want you to look at Ruth's attitude towards her mother-in-law. When she was like, so she says, I want you to go take a bath. Hey, okay, so, so ladies, let me just, yeah, that's really good. You should go take a bath, put on some perfume if you want to attract a man. Amen. Can I get an amen from the men? I mean, is this true? So go clean yourself up a little bit, you know. Brush your teeth, smell good, maybe paint your toenails. Guys like all that, all right. And so, and so, and so she says, go clean yourself up. And then when he lies down to go rest, Go lay down at his feet, uncover his feet, and, and lay down. Okay, this is Ruth's response. She, he says, she says this right here. She says, and, and it's not going to come up on scripture. I just, it's not going to come on the screen. But she goes, I will do everything that you say, Ruth. So she went down to the threshing floor that night and followed the instructions of her mother-in-law. Do you know how much advice we give people in this church, and they don't do what they what we say? I mean, what is wrong with people? What is wrong with people? And then they come back and go, my life's a mess. And, they go, and we're like, man, we tried to, we tried to help. She said, I will do everything that you say. She was submitted and committed to staying loyal and to being a disciple and living in this, in this activity of the kingdom of God. You remember Pastor Jeff last week gave the, you don't play football with tennis rackets. But that's what a lot of us were, oh, I know best. I know what I'm going to do. We're not following the word of God, and then our life ends up a mess, and we wonder why. I will do everything you say. So this is the attitude, and this is the kind of attitude and culture that we need to embrace in our own life to go, yes, I'm in the house of God. This is the field he's given me. He's provided for me, and I'm going to stay faithful. And so the third P is promise. He gives Ruth a promise. And so Ruth says, okay, I'm going to go do what you say. So she goes and lays down on her feet. And then this is the encounter right here in Ruth chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. After Boaz finished eating and drinking, he was feeling great. So he's like, oh, I'm feeling a little loose. I'm good. I'm going to go take a nap. So he lays, he lays there and he, and he falls asleep on a pile of grain. And then Ruth came quietly, uncovered his feet and lay down. And at midnight, Boaz suddenly woke up. And, and turned over, and to his surprise, he found a woman laying at his feet. Who are you? She said, I'm your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your covering over me, for you are my family redeemer. And this is what Boaz says to her. The Lord bless you, my daughter. 
Boaz ex- exclaimed, you are showing even more family loyalty now than you did before, for you have not gone after a younger man, whether rich or poor. Now, don't worry about a thing, my daughter. I will do what is necessary, for everyone in town knows you are a virtuous woman. But now, it's true that I am, uh, while it's true that I'm one of your family redeemers, there's another man who is more closely related to you than I am. So stay here tonight, and in the morning, I'll talk to him. And if he is willing to redeem you, very well, and let him marry you. But if he's not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. He makes her a promise, and then he goes and he does the right thing. Someone else had a legal right in that culture to claim her, to buy the land, and to redeem her as, as the wife. But he was, but that gentleman was like the first kinsman redeemer was like, ah, I can't do this because it's going to jeopardize my own estate. So you go ahead and take her and Boaz immediately. So hops on the opportunity, purchases the land, and that means he ends up marrying Ruth. What an incredible act of love and graciousness. What what does Hesed, what does Hesed have to do in the larger story of the Bible? Here we have a character, Ruth, from the land of Moab, who has nothing to do with the house of God, yet God foresaw that the combination of Boaz and Ruth would create an heir, and his name was Obed. And Obed would create an heir, and his name was Jesse. And Jesse would create an heir, and his name was David, who would eventually become the king. How does Hesed, these acts of kindness, how does love and action fit into the gospel story? You never know what's going to happen when you do something amazing, when you act out in God's love. His Hesed working through you, how it will transform someone's life. I've got to tell this story because my grandfather in, 19, in the summer of 1944 was taken by German troops to a labor camp. The war ended in the summer of, ni- of 1945. So he gets separated from his family and finds himself in a labor camp, but the war ends. The Germans lost, and now my grandfather finds himself all alone. There are no cell phones. There's no internet. He has no clue where his family is. My grandmother and her kids, which is my dad, and they are separated. And so my my my, my grandfather finds himself in a place where they they called them DPs, displaced persons. I'm all alone. I'm by myself. I don't I don't have anywhere to go. I don't know where my family is. And so what the government did was they said, okay. And there were many people like this that were displaced all over the whole continent. And they, they, they took him and said, where do you want to go? He said, I want to go to America. So guess what they do? They pick him up and send him to America. Ten years later, when they, when they sent him over, the Red Cross was taking the information. What's your name? Where are you from? Uh, uh. Do, are you married? Do you have kids? And so my grandfather gave all that information to the Red Cross. He goes to America. Ten years later, there's a priest in Poland. And my grandmother, who was living in Ukraine at the time, had some brothers and sisters that were living in Poland that were going to this church of the priest. And part of the priest's ministry was reconciling families after the war had ended. But the Iron Curtain was alive and well under the finger of Soviet Union occupation. And so they didn't really like messages from the BBC coming into their country. But this priest said, forget that. I know God tells me to act in love. There has to be some hesed coming out of me. And and so he says, and and I'm going to unite families. And all of a sudden, he hears on a radio broadcast that there's a man named Roman Timchuk who lives in America. And he's looking for Luba and their five kids. And he goes, wait a minute. I think I know some people in my church. And they have a sister. And her name is Luba. And she has four or five kids. I wonder if it's the same ones. And it is. And they find out that he is alive. They find out that they are alive. You 
You can't tell me that God's hand is not in that. I can't look at my past history and go, God's not involved. I can't look at my story and go, oh, no, it's just coincidence. That's my grandfather's side. Or that's my dad's side of the story. My mom's side is even crazier. Her family was hiding Jews on their farm in southern Poland during the war. My mom was not even born yet. She was born in 1946, but prior to that, they were hiding these families. What were they doing? Acts of Hesed, love in action. They were putting their life on the line. And, and after the war had ended, all these Jewish families scattered all over the world, and they stayed in touch with my mom's side of the family. Thank you so much for saving us. Thank you for providing for us. And one time they sent a care package. It was like blue jeans, some chocolate, a baby doll. Everything said made in the USA. They loved it. And my mom gets that package and says, I've got to get to America, but I don't have any money. So she writes a letter when she's 17 years old to this family in New York. She doesn't tell her mom what she's doing. And she goes, I want to come to America. Will you help me? And they said, well, your family saved our life. We're going to save yours. They bought her a ticket and put her on a boat so she can come to America. All of a sudden, my dad and my mom meet, and guess what? I'm the result. I am the fruit of God's hesed. I am living in God's hesed. I am the fruit of God's hesed. And my kids, Mariella and Catherine, get the benefit of someone else's acts of kindness. What, is, what does all this mean for us? I've gone a little bit over my time, but I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. You know, when Moses was getting ready to lead pe the people to the promised land, he was like, God, if your presence doesn't go with us, I don't want to go. I do not want to go. And he goes, how else will anyone distinguish us from everybody else in the world if your, present, if your presence doesn't go with us? And God said, I'm going to go with you. What does that mean to us today? Jesus says this in John 13, 34 and 35. He says, so now I'm going to give you a new command. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. How did Jesus love us? He forgave us. He sacrificed. He bent over backwards. He did every, He gave us chance after chance after chance. And he goes, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Church, how are we going to distinguish the kingdom of God in this world if we don't distinguish ourselves by not having this spirit the Holy Spirit wants to invade your world so much so that we can live this out you say me go man I, I'm trying I'm trying <laughs> I'm trying to do it it's so hard and that's the beautiful thing about it because God goes your weakness in your weakness I am made strong because all of a sudden he fills in we can't do it on our own you can't live the Christian life without the presence of God on the inside of you you can't do it it's impossible. Oh, that's my brother. He's calling me. He knew I was preaching. I'm sure he's saying, how'd you do, man? What does Hesed have to do? Boaz gave Ruth. He gave her a place. He gave her provision. And he gave her a promise. That's really just the reflection of everything that God gives us. God gives us a place. He gives us provision. And he gave us a promise that I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And he wants to be intimate with us. The whole story of Ruth turns because you have a man who wants to love in action. 
now it's our turn. Jesus did it for us. He showed us how. And now he's like, will you join me? I'm inviting you into the story of full life, a life that is so beyond what you can imagine. It's not just going through the motions and doing a job at my work and coming to church to check off the box. It's a life where you never know how your act is going to change someone else. You might be in a situation. You know, I, I actually sat down and had a conversation with my dad. And I said, tell me the story again. And he did. And I said to him, I said, Dad, as crazy as it sounds, the best thing that happened to our family was that my grandfather got dragged away to a labor camp. How can you say that? That's a terrible situation. If that wouldn't have happened, he wouldn't be in America. He would have never met my mom. You never know how your dark situation might turn out to be the biggest blessing. You never know how a dark situation could turn into be a blessing in this big mosaic that God is trying to create. We just can't look at the moment. What is your takeaway for today? You can trust God. Even in dark moments, in dark situations, you can trust God. He still loves us even when we abandon Him. He is still faithful, but he wants us to grow up. And he wants us to get healing and he wants to reclaim us so that then we can repeat that effort for other people so that they can see who God is in coming to the kingdom. Come on, why don't we bow our heads right now? God, I thank you. For the book of Ruth, I thank you that you're showing us things. You're telling us stories. You're showing us how you really want to be real. You want to be in relationship with us. You want to forgive us. You have forgiven us. We just need to respond to you with open hearts. Just like Ruth did, she was willing. She submitted herself. She stayed with her mother-in-law. She committed to discipleship. She said, I will do everything you say. God, help us to be like Ruth. I will do everything that you say. Fill us now and change us so that we can grow your kingdom and let other people find salvation in your name.